Okay, I will do a quick review again of the things that could potentially be seen on the test this afternoon and then get into four vectors. So first things that we could see this afternoon. One, the derivation of how Maxwell's equations support an electromagnetic wave. Now this is complicated, right? You have those four steps and you have the mathematical identity. Obviously, I would, if I were to give you this, I'd give you that mathematical identity, right? Wouldn't expect you to memorize it. Um, but it's, you know, the, the process we went through in class on how to take Maxwell's equations, so I have Maxwell's equations written here, and how to get to this equation here, which is the wave equation with one problem. Oh, wait, no, it's fine. It has the del squared. Yeah. I didn't see the del squared. Nice thing. There's no derivative on the right side. So that's the first thing. So, you know, you just have to remember those steps. Take the curl and be able to do it. That means you say, hmm. Oops. Don't, don't put it upside down. It means something different. So you do that first. Then you do that identity on this side and do the two substitutions with this equals zero and, well, <laughs> this is already written equal, or yeah, this one here with this here is zero. And, and the answer pops out. Yes. And you said that since the del is um, a spatial partial derivative, or it, it yeah, the, doesn't affect time? That's right. So you can pull out the DDT from that del cross? Right, you, you can move DDT across the del. Okay. okay, so that's the first thing. And just as a reminder, the reason this could show up on this exam was because we didn't get to it until the day of the last exam. Clearly, it couldn't have shown up on that exam. Okay, the next thing, what we did two weeks ago was the, the brachistochrome problem showing that Fermat was indeed correct that light takes the path of the shortest time. So this here is showing that the path of shortest time gives us the same relationship as Snell's law, right? Snell's law is derived using Huygens principle. This is derived using the Brachistochrone. They come to the same result, which means that Fermat was correct. The path light takes is the path of shortest time to go from point A to point B. The final thing that we, only three things you have to be concerned about that could show up on the test. The final thing would be, come on, the <clears throat> single and double slit. Remember we worked on the single slit. The single slit was very simple. There was no calculus there. It was just introducing the concept of how we use the electric field to find the um, intensity equation. And so the part that has calculus, the part that would potentially show up would be this side here of how you find the intensity pattern for a single slit. And so this one here, you have light going through a single slit. And of course the, <clears throat> the intensity is going to be proportional to the electric field vector squared at the screen. So you have to take the electric fields coming through everywhere from the top to the bottom of the slit and add them together. But going to some place on the screen, you would have a different distance as illustrated by this picture. Remember when I actually drew the picture, I drew a near field picture so you could see what's going on. Even though our calculation is done in the far field, where we have this relationship here that the path length difference is just this angle times or the sign of that angle times how far you moved across. So you have the same thing here. You have the path length differs depending on how far across the slit you are. And so each little position as you move across the slit is going to have a different path length 
and you have to add up the electric fields you get from all of those. And of course, if it's continuous, adding them up means an integral. And the way we do that integral is not mathematically per se, it's graphically. We take the slit and break it up into an infinite number of virtual slits. So this picture here, of course, their infinite number is like eight in this picture, because once again, you can't actually draw an infinite number of slits in there. And then you take, you say for each one of these little slits, I have an electric field of the same magnitude, but a slightly different phase when it gets to the screen. And so then we add vectors tip to tail. And so this diagram, the red line is showing the tip to tail addition of each one of those phasers so that the resultant is going from the starting point to your ending point. And then we just use geometry from that diagram to calculate what the electric field going from starting to ending point was compared to the electric field going across the entire slit, which would just be the length of the arc. That was what we did last week. Recall? And then once we have this equation, you could you know, find where the maxima occur, where the minima occur. Um, finding where the maxima occur is harder than the minima. Why is it easy to find the minima for this? Actually, that's what we have to do for the maxima. That's why it's harder. It's just going to be where this argument here is an integer multiple of pi. And so you don't have to do any derivatives there. You just have to say, well, pi a over lambda sine theta equals pi times an integer. That quickly gets you to your equation. So like for the general physics class, we only talked about where the minima equation is because that's the easy one. For the maxima, you actually have to take the derivative of the top and bottom. Let, let's actually just do that just so you can set di d theta, evaluate theta max is equal to zero. If I take this derivative, <clears throat> I'm going to have equals I ought times, and we have to use the quotient rule, or as I, I always do the product rule, I'm sorry. Um, so I'm going to put 2 sine chain rule times the derivative of the inside which is cosine and then times again the chain rule that's wow it's not going to fit anywhere close to on one line the size i'm writing is it because i have to take that and then multiply it by the other term which is dividing by pi a over lambda sine theta. And then I have plus Oh, wait a minute. I made a mistake also. Let's let's get rid of all of this. I made a mistake. What mistake did I make? I have the square out on the top and that's going to make my life actually easier to do that first. That's my mistake I made. So I'm just going to bring down the two and then write this whole thing. And then I have to take the derivative of the stuff that's inside. The stuff that's inside is going to be <laughs> whoops. Go back.
Nice. Better. And so I still have to take that derivative there that's shown. That derivative is going to be Na, 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 na. And derivative of one over sine theta. I think I did that right. So what a beautiful equation. And now we have to set that equal to zero. So we take this dd theta thing attached to that and set it equal to zero. And we're going to have zeros every time that there is an integer multiple for pi, but we already know those are the ones that correspond to the minima. So the ones that correspond to the maxima are going to be the ones that correspond to this derivative right here being equal to zero. And so I take this and I set this equal to zero and I'm going to have cosine theta is that I can divide out, sine theta that I can divide out. Um, Don't you have to multiply the first term by sine to... I, yeah. I have to do that so I can factor out the... Uh, nope, put it under the wrong one. There, that should come out right. And so when that's equal to zero then it's equal to zero and that's where I have my maxima. And so then I have to go through and, and solve for what thetas will make that equal to zero, which is still not easy. So <clears throat> yeah, this one here probably a little long to give you on the test, but I could give you pieces, things like how do you do it? You know, what's the process going to be that kind of stuff. Um, the, the one to find, well, yeah, we already did find the minima. Uh, as you saw in a previous test, one of the ones I actually looked at them, so I won't repeat it, won't give you the one to show that it's a maximum at theta equals zero. I was actually going to do that, and then I looked at the test, and I was like, row, row, go back and look at the other options again. So any questions about the basically three different areas that we could have questions on the test? Ready. You'll be providing those the equations for us? Yeah, they're on the equation sheet. Okay. Any other questions? Are we going to able to draw like those diagrams this? Yeah, yeah. You'll have to draw diagrams to go along with your picture. So yeah, if you were doing something with the single slate, you'd have to draw both a diagram like this and a diagram like that. The right diagram. Um, yeah, the right diagram is showing the addition of the phase vectors. So you have the phase vectors have a slightly different, they have the same magnitude for each one because you have the same magnitude of electric field going through each of your virtual slits. But they have a different phase angle because you have a slightly different path length going through each of your virtual slits. Right, so the way it's going here, we would say the one at the bottom has the shortest path length. And the one right above it is a slightly longer path length. How much longer? 
that's what the delta is that's shown there. Delta is equal to dx, which is the width of your slit, times the sine of the angle, where theta is the angle from the normal to the slit to where you're viewing. And so since they each have a slightly different angle, when you're making a phase vector, you're showing the angle by the direction of the, of the, of the vector. And so if you look at this diagram, you see the black lines is showing a discrete set of phase vectors being added tip to tail. But since we have an infinite number of, of phase vectors, then we have continuously changing direction. And so we just draw a circular arc to show that continuously changing direction. And then we had to use our geometry. Remember, I went through the geometry. I used the radius r, but I just canceled it out. So the, the radius r wasn't an important thing. What was important was how we relate the length. I need to change colors because red and red is getting confusing to me. The length of this, which we call the electric field at phase, the phase meaning at whatever angle you're looking at, compared to the total length that you have on the red arc. That was, it was the ratio of those squared because intensity is proportional to electric field squared that gave us the intensity relationship. So the, um, the angle, the angle in that, in my diagram I used, when, when I did it in class, I used beta, so I had slightly different nomenclature, but the angle that you have from here to here is the, um, the maximum angle that you can get for the difference in the phases and you go from there. Aaron. I'm just confused because you had electric field equations in here and you had it like E sub N equals E odd over N sine of omega T plus two pi. Yeah. Ln over lambda. Yes. But then when we did the graphical integral, we didn't really use those equations. We just used the relationship between E odd. Those equations were what gave us this graph. Okay. Right, because each one of those electric fields is represented in the, in this picture here, the, the straight black lines would be discrete each one of those electric fields, right? Because each one has a different, you know, you have the omega t's the same in all of them, but then you had plus a part that's slightly changing for each one. And so that slightly changing part is the part that's changing the direction here. So this is showing each of the black arrows is the same length, but a slightly different angle because of the slightly different phase angle. And then the red line is saying, okay, so now if it's continuous, if you actually have a continuous slit, then these have to be infinitesimal little virtual slits, and then they're just continuously changing angle. So would we need to show those uh, first equations for the electric field, or would we just need to explain what you were saying? Um, I, I would not have you do the entire problem, but you'd have to understand how it goes, so you'd have to be able to explain each step or to do one part of it. Other questions? All right, then we will go on to Lorentz transformations, working with four vectors. So the Lorentz transformation is the way we transform an event in one reference frame to an event in another reference frame. So once again, an event is a location, x, y, and z coordinates, plus a time. We start off with looking at things that are four vector invariants. That is, the, the four vector has a length. We have to be able to define how we calculate the length that doesn't depend on your reference frame. Relativity, we start off by saying your measurements depend on your reference frame. It's correct, but it's a different value in different reference frames. Now we're looking for what could you have that doesn't change with reference frame. That's the same in every reference frame. And if you do things like particle physics, these are incredibly useful because it simplifies a lot of your math. 
So the example we start with is saying that we have two reference frames, one that we call the S reference frame and one that we call the S prime reference frame. And in those reference, well, one reference frame is moving in the Z direction with respect to the other. Now, what direction is the Z direction? No one cares. We define the Z direction as the direction of the relative velocities. So, you know, if one reference frame is moving in this direction with respect to me, then Z direction would be that way. If it's moving that direction with respect to me, Z direction would be that direction. So Z is just the direction of the relative motion. Um, oh, crud. In this picture, <laughs> in this picture, it looks like it is moving in the X direction instead of the Z direction. We always, well, I said that backward. The X direction is the direction it's moving. We still don't care. We just choose the direction. And yes, the convention is the X direction. So V defines X direction. Boy, I said that wrong with the Z. With that in mind, then, we're going to have the two reference frames traveling. So at just, question, Megan? What does that word say? <laughs> defines. Oh, defines. Okay. You know, it's a lot easier when it's my own writing. Um, we were trying to decode a letter we received from a relative this past Sabbath. And Amy tried reading for a while, and then I tried reading for a while, and yeah, I understand the trouble. I'm sorry about my handwriting. So we're going to have these two reference frames, and one travels by, and at the very instant that their origins are the same location, we A, are going to synchronize the clocks so they both agree that the event that's zero position in the X, zero in the Y, zero in the Z, and zero in the time is the same location. And at that very instant, a light flashes at the origin. So you have a picture in your mind? The light flashes. Now, if you are in the unprimed reference frame, the reference frame that sees the prime one is moving there, what do you say, how does the light expand? By like X direction, Y direction, Z direction, how does it vary in those directions? Like, is, is the light going faster in the X direction, faster in the Y direction, faster in the Z direction, or the same in all directions? Same in all directions. Same in all directions, right? So you would have the light expand forming a sphere, and the radius of that sphere is the speed of light multiplied by time. Now, the person that's moving with respect to you also should see in their reference frame, the light is expanding in a spherical shape, right? So in both reference frames, you see the light expanding in a spherical reference frame. Now, if you think about this, if you had a ball, just a solid ball in the two reference frames, if it's a sphere in one reference frame, what's it going to... Okay, that's actually a bad example because the perspective... When you do the calculations, it turns out that because you're changing the angle, it, it stays a sphere. I, I should change it to a cube. If you have a cube in one reference frame, in the other reference frame, it would look shortened in the direction it's moving, right? Not only would it look shortened, it would not look like it has square sides because it, it would look like a parallelogram because of the relative motion. But here we have... Both of them agree it's making a sphere, and the radius in each one is C multiplied by the time. But of course, time travels at a different rate in one reference frame than in the other reference frame. But they agree that they have the same radius. Another four-vector invariant that we use is energy momentum. But we're starting with the space-time one. So here I'm going through two reference frames are synchronized. So at time equals time prime equals zero, a light flashed at the origin. Light extends a spherical shell. <laughs> um, how do we find the radius in terms of x, y, and z coordinates? 
If it was two dimensional, if it was an X and Y, how would you find the radius? Okay, basically the Pythagorean theorem. X squared plus Y squared is equal to R squared is the equation for a circle. For a sphere, you just generalize that to three dimensions and you have the radius squared is equal to X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared. And so, So the equation for the radius in both reference frames looks like that. Well, what are we going to do? We are going to, okay, I went to the quick of it in the next one. We just saw from what I did in the previous slides that radius is CT and radius prime is CT prime. So I can put these as C squared T squared equals x squared plus y squared plus z squared or c squared t prime squared equals x prime squared plus y prime squared plus z prime squared. Now I said we want to find something that's invariant. Well here's something that's invariant. If I subtract c squared t squared from both sides here Actually, we do it the other way around. Well, I'm going to do it the other way around. I'm going to subtract x squared, subtract y squared, subtract z squared. This is now an invariant. Zero, it's always zero, whatever reference frame you have, if you take the C times time quantity squared minus X squared minus Y squared minus Z squared, it's always equal to zero. So we call that a space-time invariant. And that's going to give us something useful for mathematical purposes. So here's the equation that I just wrote on the preceding slide. And what we want to do is we want to say, okay, how can we take this and put it as a vector, the radius, in terms of the four quantities in there? Well, you can see that we generalize the Pythagorean theorem for a circle x squared plus y squared is radius squared to three dimensions, to x squared plus y squared plus z squared is the radius. And now we have a four-dimensional equivalent to that where we're going to put in time as a fourth dimension. But it's not just time. You have to put C multiplied by time for the fourth dimension. So we have four dimensions in the space-time, each one with a dimension, a, a unit of distance. And the dimensions are, and we usually write them this way, x0 is equal to ct, x1 is equal to x, x2 is equal to y, and x3 is equal to z. And so we can write these as a column vector or a row vector. So here I've written r, the radius, as a column vector that has the ct, the x0, the x1, the x2, and x3. And then we actually have to introduce a way of multiplying these to get our invariant. That is, we have to introduce that if I take r dot r, it's going to give me equal to zero. And there's multiple ways that mathematicians do this. One of them is just to define the way you transform from a column vector to a row vector is by putting these minus signs in. And so that's the, the method of showing it that I've opted for here. So the column vector and the row vector to transform, we have to change the signs of the x, y, and z components. And then if you multiply those together, you guys know how to multiply column and row vectors? 
So we just take that and we take the first one in, always in linear algebra, the first one in a given, the first column in a given row times the first item in a given column plus the second item in the same row times the second item in the same column. And you just go your way through. And so we get our four vector invariant there. So far, you've seen nothing to tell you how this is useful. You've only seen building up what seems like a lame idea. So how do we make this useful? Well, we've seen that we have time dilation, that time varies based on your speed. And we have length contraction, that length varies based on speed. And so we're going to use this invariant to try to find a way to relate those. So we have one set of equations that we relate the time, the x, y, and z positions for a, an event in one reference frame from the other. So to make some kind of transformation, we're going to start off with the simple, we define the velocities in the x direction. If the velocity is in the x direction, what does that tell you about the length variation in the y and z directions? There's no change. They're the same. Because we only had length contraction in the direction parallel to the motion. So this is only showing two dimensions, the time dimension and the x dimension, because the y and z dimensions aren't going to be changed. So why worry about the derivation for an unchanging variable. So if we're going to relate the time and x positions, we must have some kind of relationship that the new time is dependent on you know, the position and the time in the other reference frame. And so this is just defining a linear algebra relationship. This is just like what we did in electric circuits, where we took the equation and we said this column vector t prime x prime is equal to this matrix that has those four coefficients times tx. If you take this and follow the rules of multiplying vectors, you have t prime equals, and I'm just going to take that a b, multiply it by tx, which is a t plus bx. What was that? It's the wrong way around based on the equation that's right above it. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> I didn't notice that. This should have, yes. Well, poo. It, it is indeed. Um, I know my work is going to be correct in the end because I went through it, but I didn't even notice that, that difference. You, does everybody see what he pointed out? The B is with the X instead of the A with the X. So if I wanted to actually make it match this set of equations, I should have had B, A, and D, C. That is a little embarrassing, especially because I used the same slide last year and I didn't notice it neither did any students. Okay, let's go on. And we know that just using our length contraction equations, if I have some object and I want to say, okay, it moved the distance X prime in the S prime frame. So in the, in the moving reference frame, it moved some distance X prime. In my reference frame on Earth, how much did it move? I say, well, it moved the distance that the reference frame traveled plus the distance of the object in the other reference frame divided by gamma because I have to remember I have length contraction. And so this gives me a relationship that says, hmm, if I multiply both sides, well, don't multiply both sides by gamma. Let's just take this and solve it for x prime. 
So if I solve it for X prime, I'll multiply both, yeah, multiply every term by gamma. So I would have X gamma equals V T gamma plus X prime. And then solve it for X prime and I get X prime is equal to X gamma minus VT gamma is equal to gamma times X minus VT. So I have here a relationship that gives me the X component in the prime frame in terms of the X and time in the unprime frame. That's going to give me half of the information I need to find how we transform. Any questions? Because right, this one here is right. I didn't make a mistake, so <laughs> gotta, gotta make sure we're good on that. Now we're gonna do the basically same thing. We're gonna take the equation that we had here and say, okay, what if we wanted to, to reverse this and say, what is it gonna be like in the prime frame reference to the unprime frame? Well, in the prime frame, the velocity of the unprime frame is the same value, but in the opposite direction. So the V is going to change its sign, but otherwise the equation will be the same. Why does the V change sign? Because you see the other reference frame going in the opposite direction. So this here is taking the same starting equation, but changing the sign of that V and changing every prime to the unprime and vice versa. And now we're going to take this. And the previous equation we had for X prime. And so this here is what we had for X prime on the previous equation. And the X prime is equal to this new equation. Now what's the only unknown? T prime. And so what do we solve for? We solve for T prime. And so with this equation... There's the equation I just multiplied the gammas through. If I want to solve for T prime, I'm going to move this across and then divide by minus V. So I'm going to have there's the first step where I just move the X over gamma to the other side. And of course I can factor out something. And what I'm going to factor out is, well, eh, factor out an X X gamma, so that's one minus and X over gamma and I factor out an X gamma, it's one over gamma squared. And then I need to divide everything by minus V. And so because of this minus sign, I'm going to change the order of the two things in the parentheses. So there's my equation for the time as shown here. And then the last step is, I guess I shouldn't put a box around it. The last step is factor out a gamma. And so that should be, oh, yeah, there's one more step after that. It's correct, but there's one more step. What's that one more step? What is gamma squared? Hey, 
gamma, gamma is one over square root of one over one minus b squared over c squared. So one over gamma squared, which is what I have, actually have there, is just one minus v squared over c squared. Because of the one over, get rid of the one over. And so if I put that in here, one minus v squared over c squared minus one, the one to subtract out. And so one over gamma squared minus one is just equal to minus v squared over c squared. And so this was divided by V. Got to change this to a minus sign because of this minus sign. And it's going to be X V over C squared. And that should be the final equation right there. Good. Yeah, I have time to finish. So that's an equation to transform from T and X into T prime. So I have an event and an event that occurs here on earth is measured to occur at time of 12 noon and a position of, you know, five miles east in the X direction compared to the Y and Z. And this says, okay, if I'm in a reference frame that has our starting condition of the calibration of when time is equal to zero and the origin is zero, then in that reference frame, this same event will occur at a time that is different by this equation. So I'm not calculating before we did time dilation, the time between two events. Now we're just doing the time for this event in one reference frame compared to the other. So we're halfway through our conversion. We have the time conversion. So how do we go from that? Well, we already determined that, let's see, is that exactly the equation we had? x prime, yeah, we determined that x prime was equal to gamma times x minus vt, and x prime is equal to minus vt prime plus x over y. Taking those equations, we can then solve for, well, actually, this equation already was in terms of x and v. So these, these two equations give me my transformation. And now, hopefully, I did this matrix right. So if I take this and I multiply these equations, we'll see if I did this matrix right. We should have T prime is equal to gamma times one times T minus V over C squared times X and X prime is equal to gamma times, this is gonna be minus V T plus x so is that what we had up above yay it is so this this one i did the the calculation correctly so now we have a way of transforming from one reference frame to another reference frame for a single event that has its x y and z coordinates defined and its time with the definition that we agree when time zero is x equals zero, y is equals zero, z is equals zero for both frames, and it has velocity v in the x direction. Generalizing these using simplifications of defining beta is v over c, as we've done in class, and the definitions for the four vector components as I described earlier today, then we can write the generalized transformation equations to transform x0, that's essentially the time, right, since x0 is c multiplied by time. So transforming the time is gamma times x0 minus beta x1. Now you might ask, wait a minute, where did that beta come from? Before it was like, you know, v over c squared, right? But since x0 is multiplied by c, it then has just a v over c, and beta is the v over c. So this here gives me a complete set of equations to transform from one reference frame to another. 
So if I have in the earth reference frame, I measure something that occurs at time x0, position x1, x2, and x3, I can determine exactly what time and position that's going to be in another reference frame. Or the reverse transformations, if you just reverse the equations, the easiest way to reverse the equations is to realize, as we said at the beginning, what's the difference in the prime frame and the unprime frame? The direction of V. That's the only difference. So to change it from being derived for converting into the prime frame from the unprimed to the other way around, convert it into the, actually I said that backward, convert from the unprimed frame into the prime frame. You know those green things were just supposed to show you the um, variables? Now I look at it, it looks like I put primes on everything, doesn't it? That is not what that was supposed to indicate. I am going to erase those so there is not the confusion that they're all primed. Instead, I'll underline them each. Right, the unprimed variables to transform into the primed, or to reverse it, we simply change these signs from negative to plus because the velocity is in the opposite direction as measured in the other reference frame. So those we call our Lorentz transforms, they allow us to transform from one reference frame into another. And it actually all started by recognizing that we have a, an invariant in time x, y, and z. Because we have that invariant in time x, y, and z, then we can derive this. And it turns out that we have other invariants as well. We have an invariant between momentum and energy. That, without going through any of the details of it, the invariant is that I believe that's the invariant. I didn't prepare beforehand, so I'm kind of <laughs> kind of hoping that I'm right. So th this here is an invariant that allows us to make four vectors and four vector transformations that follow exactly the same rules for energy and momentum. So that means these here you can replace, we call P0 is equal to MC. P1 is equal to MVX, P2 is equal to MVY, P3 is equal to MVZ. And we can then transform I, I'm thinking about this. Do I have this right? I think I do. I, I wish I had checked that before class. Um, that is checking this invariant. Actually, yeah, it, it, here's, I have these two in the opposite positions. That's the invariant because mass is invariant one reference frame to another. So I have those in the opposite positions. But then we can use exactly the same um, transformations to transform energy and momentum from one reference frame to another reference frame. So we only have one minute. I don't really have time to do an example of doing the Lorentz transformation, but one of the keys, something that I will, I'll do it next Tuesday, is how we get our derivations for the velocity of an, the addition of velocities. In class yesterday, I was supposed to get to addition of velocities, but I didn't. In class today, I was supposed to get to addition of velocities, and I didn't. I'm very consistent. So next week, we will pick up with how we can add velocities, comparing velocities in one reference frame to another reference frame. We'll see in class tomorrow 
how it works if they're in the same direction. In class a week from today, we'll see how they work if they're both parallel and perpendicular. Okay, I'll see y'all for the test. We're excited, right?